Lord God, we thank you so much for this uh, man of God that's uh, just hot after you, Father, that's just after your word, after who you are and what you want to do in Penticton and the world, Father. And I just pray right now for his, his own uh, spirit, his own uh, words, God, that you would just use him to speak to us, God, that we would be um, ones to just hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Good morning. How's everyone this morning? Good. Hey, I want to talk to you about uh, a couple things today. One of the things is, is, is finding inspiration, and the other thing is being inspiration. And that's kind of it. Um, so we can go. No, just kidding. It's 11 o'clock. Um, we have a water baptism at Skaha Lake at 12.30, so I'll uh, try to keep an eye on the time, of course, and make sure we're not here too long. Uh, there's been a whole lot going on in, in, in my life and my family's life. This past year has been a very interesting year. Actually, it's been um, a year and a couple days to date that I've been working away from home. I, for those of you, a little introduction. I'm, my name's Brian Kerr. I mean, there's obviously some people out there that don't know who I am. And uh, we've lived in Penticton for eight years. And um, we moved from northern BC. Um, in the last year, I've been working away. I've uh, For the first majority of that year, I was up near Fort McMurray. I'm an electrician. Uh, we were working on a, my part of the project there was a cogeneration facility, taking all the waste gases and generating power, about 20% used by a local facility and about 80% being um, sold to the grid in Alberta. So really just a big power plant more than anything else. And uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, money being generated by that part of the project once, once it was up and running. Um, since then, that project uh, finished up. Um, I've moved to Saskatoon. I've been up there now for a couple of turnarounds, as it's called, but uh, I've been asked to stay longer both times, so it's been longer than it was supposed to be. But what I'm doing there is pretty cool, actually. And I'm, I'm kind of passionate about this stuff, so this is all, all about finding inspiration, right? So I'm, I'm passionate about what, what I do. I'm not, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm going away and working, uh, what I've always said to people, the only hard part about what I'm doing is being away from home. I actually love the work. And I love the people that are there, and I love the dynamics of these huge projects. Like the, the first project that I was on was a couple billion dollar project. This project's about a billion and a half. And it's kind of neat that it's just so big and massive, and there's, you know, three, four hundred, five hundred ton cranes all around you, and this and that. And, and, and because of that, there's some danger involved. Uh, and my last, uh, not this turnaround, the turnaround before, somebody did die on site. I mean, stuff happens, and it's awful. It should never happen, but it does happen. Um, but the, the part of the project that I'm, that, I, that I'm involved in, there's, there's these two huge motors. And if you know, those of you electricians will, will really appreciate this. And those of you that aren't, well, maybe the numbers will make you appreciate it. But they're, they're basically, both the motors are about as big as a house. And they, they sit opposite each other. And they're in, the, they're in this huge building. And the motors themselves are 8,200 horsepower, 13,800 volts, which is, which is very cool. And uh, what these motors do, there's a big drum in between them. And there's all these cables that go up this big tower, and they hoist 50 tons of ore from three kilometers down in the earth up to the surface and fast. Within a few minutes, it's up. And uh, it does that. That's it's designed to basically replace a 25-ton hoist that does the same thing, but just doubling the capacity of the mine. And so that's the reason for this upgrade. Anyway, so that's my part of the project. I'm actually looking after that part of the project, which is pretty cool for me. And uh, it, it actually gets me all fired up when I'm when I'm there. I, I just love it. And there's about 40 or 50 guys, depending on the day, that are, that are working there with me and, and doing all kinds of things. And, and it's not just the two big motors. Of course, there's all kinds of stuff to make these motors work. There's the controls and the, you know, the, the braking systems and the cooling systems. And you know, then the building itself has to have lighting, of course, and the odd plug here and there. And you know, just, just all kinds of neat stuff. And I guess the reason I'm sharing this is that, in a sense, the whole thing about finding inspiration, though, in a sense, because of financial situation, it's almost like you, know, you, you, you take this square peg and you try to put it in this round hole. Has anybody ever tried to do that in their life? You know, and what happens is you get frustrated. You're, you're, you're trying to take the square peg and throw it in the round hole you know, over and over and over again because really it's what you should be doing. I mean, that, that square peg's got to fit in that round hole. But ultimately it doesn't fit. And it's like, I think when we find ourselves doing what we're not supposed to be doing long enough, all of a sudden we find ourselves that there's... There's, whether it's a, a spiritual thing, and I believe that it certainly could be, or whether it's just natural circumstances, I believe it could be that too. We find ourselves, whether it be financial, 
whether it be relationship, whether it be whatever it is, because of the fact is you're frustrated and you've been doing things for a long time that have frustrated you, it's actually causing certain things to unfold in your life. And because of that, there has to be a change. You, got, you have to make a change. And, and for me, the change was kind of forced because before I moved here, I was involved in, in, in big projects, not that big, but you know, sawmill expansions and, and uh, mine renovations and expansions and stuff. They weren't multi-billion dollar projects, but they were just big projects in Northern BC and in the Yukon. And I really loved what I did. And then when I moved to, the, to, to Penticton, you know, obviously, like, the neat thing about being up there is basically my family was pretty portable. We spent five years together in the Yukon. We kind of moved and did it together. We did, because of that, the kids had a variety of schooling, homeschooling, and this and that. And, and um, you know, they're kind of a product of, of that kind of lifestyle, but it was, it was a lot of fun. And we were a Christian family doing it together. We, we met, obviously, lots of Christian people here and there. Anyway, then we moved to Penticton. And uh, Penticton is a beautiful place. In fact, Penticton is a place to stay forever. That's what the, what the word means, right? I love it here. I was born here. And uh, I never lived here, but I was born here. My, my mom had me here, and then I came full circle, and I'm back. I've been back for years. But anyway, we moved to Penticton, and then everything changed for me, like, occupation-wise, where once I got back into electrical contracting, it was, it was stuff that I really wasn't used to. It was a lot of smaller stuff and, you know, uh, smaller jobs and, and uh, you know, commercial-type stuff. And, and, again, it was kind of like the – and I was in business. And when, and, and when you're doing business and you're not doing it very well, you're not making any money. And uh, so I, I, I floundered at that realistically. I mean, I made some money and then lost a pile of money. And then we had some other events happen where people, like, in a big way, didn't pay us. Like, we were involved in that South Okanagan uh, event center, the, the academy project, the, that dorm project that was in the papers for all that kind of stuff. And it was an electrical contract on that project and build out a lot of money and didn't get paid. Anyway, so there, there, there's all that kind of stuff that happens. But at the end of the day, even though we're still reeling from that, like there's still, there's still some wounds with all that, but there's a, there's a blessing on the other side because all of a sudden I was forced to go back to what I'm good at. And all, I, I, kinda, I didn't realize in a sense, and I'm not saying this in any weird and funny, arrogant way, but I didn't realize how good I was at it until I got it back at it again and, and how fun it is and how much I enjoy doing what I'm doing, like occupation-wise. And I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures because sometimes, actually, you know what? I think I'll read it off my, oh, we're, we, we, we just moved too, by the way. We, because of all this financial stuff, basically we're forced to sell our house. And then we moved out to Naramata, so I can't find half my stuff right now. And uh, oh, one thing about that is you're finding inspiration, right? I talked about that. I'm just going to go back to this in a minute. But even something as small as, I mean, it's big. When you're in the middle of moving, it's a big deal, right? But Kim basically you know, spearheaded that move all by herself because I was away working. And I mean, that, that is wonderful and I appreciate it very much and I'm inspired by that. But also some of you that just pitched in and helped with all kind, in all kinds of little ways, thank you very much for doing that. It was, it was greatly appreciated, whether it was meals or helping with cleaning and packing and all that kind of stuff. Just, you know, again, thank you. Thank you very much. And that's very inspirational. That is me finding inspiration. That's awesome stuff. But let's turn to First Samuel. I think I'm going to read it on here because I have an NIV Bible in front of me, but I like it in the message better, and I have that on this thing. I'm not texting my friends here. I'm just trying to find what I want to read. Yeah, where are we at here? I think it's there. Okay, where are we at? Yeah, it's it's a real familiar scripture. It's it's a, the story of the story of David and Goliath. But I want I want to make a kind of a different point here than just the fact that David. You know, I've made this point with the scripture before that David was young, and he you know he kind of was was ready for this and he was equipped and he went, went and did it but I want to make a different point here uh, we'll start in verse 32 of uh, Samuel 1 Samuel 17 I'll, I'll give you a moment to get there for those of you that are following along we know the you know the story here Sam, uh, David got left behind you know he's tending his dad's sheep his brothers are going to battle and he's feeling pretty jealous about it so he wants to go check it out when he gets there there's this giant Philistine taunting the armies of Israel. You know, and I, I, I kind of talked about this stuff a little bit in the past, but the fact of the matter is, is sometimes, sometimes we'll feel like we're being taunted by giants. And, and, and we just are, are paralyzed sometimes with fear. And that, that giant can be anything. That giant can be death. You know, for me, it's been, it's been realistically, um, in the last few years, it's been dealing with uh, some fairly significant business debt. You know, that's been a giant. Or it could be relationships issues, right? So 
some of you have faced that giant. You know, it could be uh, things going on in your family with your children or your moms and your dads or, or whatever. That, but there's these things that, that we face sometimes and we just get paralyzed with fear and we don't know how to act. And then, and then there's this little David guy, he rises up. He says in verse 32, he's talking to the king. He says, Master, said David, don't give up hope. I'm ready to go and fight this Philistine. And that's the whole thing about, that's the whole thing about finding inspiration. The whole army of Israel is paralyzed with fear by this giant. And it takes this kid who's about 16 years old to basically inspire an army. And that's what I, the whole thing about finding inspiration. What all of a sudden is going to motivate me to do something? What's going what's to get me off the couch? I love Miss Vicky's salt and vinegar chips. And when I, get, when I get depressed, I can eat a whole family pack of those things. Easy. I love them. You know what I mean? And some people love nachos and whatever it is. But you know what? It's, it's not a good sign if you find me kind of half sprawled on the couch with a, 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 you know, a, a 90% empty bag of Miss Vicky's with a few crumbs around me, cuddling with a dog. Because you know what? That, that means I'm not really doing that well. And uh, anyway... I guess there's worse ways you can battle with depression, but I do love Miss Vicky's. Anyway, uh, Master said, David, don't give up hope. I'm ready to go and fight this Philistine. Uh, Saul answered, David, you can't go and fight this Philistine. You're too young and inexperienced. And he's been at the fighting business since before you were born. David said, I've been a shepherd tending sheep for my... I'm not going to read all this. In uh, 34 to 37, I'll carry on down. Basically, he's been a shepherd. He killed bears. He's done all kinds of good stuff in his life, right? Then this is what I want to get to. Then Saul outfitted David as a soldier in armor. He put his bronze helmet on his head and belted his sword on, on him over the armor. David tried to walk away, but he could barely budge, or could hardly budge. David told Saul, I can't even move with all this stuff on me. I'm not used to this. And he took it all off. Again, what I want to get to is the whole, the, the square peg round hole thing. David, he could have just went and, and, you know, I'm a soldier now. I'm going to fight this Philistine, so I'm just going to put on this armor and away I go. And was, was that who David was? David really wasn't a soldier. He was a shepherd. And all that soldier stuff, all that armor, all that did was basically, well, that would have been him pretending that he was something other than what he wasn't. He wasn't a soldier. Yeah, he'd, he'd killed wild animals protecting his sheep and all that, but he wasn't a soldier. And sometimes because of pressure, whatever it is, what kind of pressure, the pressure comes from all kinds of sources. It comes from peers, you know, especially with, in, in, in you that are kind of in the teenage years, or it can come from parents, or it can come from, from you know, the church, or it can come from the world. It tries to make you what you're not supposed to be. All of a sudden, because... Now, again, when I'm, when I'm saying what I'm saying, I'm not disqualifying anything. Everything is qualified. It, it says in the Bible, basically, uh, that nothing of itself, all by itself, is, is, is evil or whatever. It, every, everything is qualified when I say this. If someone says, you've got to go to university, you don't really feel like it. You don't, I mean, it's, and it's not just because you're lazy, it's because you've got a passion for something else. Or, or, or someone says, well, don't waste your time going to university. Go, go get a trade. But you got a passion. All of a sudden, you, you know, you want to study something in university. You know, there, there's this whole thing about people trying to force you into being a soldier when you're a shepherd. You know, if you're called to be a, a shepherd, you're going to get a chance to kill some bears and some lions, maybe even the odd giant. But the fact of the matter is, you're called to be a shepherd. You're not called to be a soldier. So don't be a soldier. Don't put on the armor. You, you get what I'm saying there? You get what I'm saying? Like, if whatever, and, and this is really, like, there's a whole pile of us out there, including me. We're all trying to figure out what we're supposed to be when we grow up, right? And, uh, and there's been, because realistically, all through our lives, there's changes, there's transitions. You know, I, I just look at uh, Terry and Claire, going through huge transitions, sold, sold the business, right? Moving into different t things. And, and, and I'm, I, you know, I know, I know that as the future moves ahead, it gets clearer and clearer. But at first, there's fear and trepidation. What are we supposed to do now with this next phase of our lives? What does God have in store for us? For those of you kids that graduated from high school last, you know, last summer or last spring, same thing. There's all of a sudden a boom. Do I go to school? Do I go to work? Do I go to work, then go to school? You know what I mean? How, what, what, what is, what's next for me? And those of you that have finished college, perhaps, or those of you that are, uh, that are well into your careers, and, but you have an inkling that you might want to do something else, you might want to change careers. And if I ask for a show of hands here, it'd be pretty interesting. In fact, I think I will. Of all you working people out there, how many of you, including myself, have actually changed careers over the years? If you look around and see all the hands, you see it's pretty common. Most everybody changes careers in their lifetime. And, and, and there's all kinds of reasons for that. One of the reasons, some of the reasons are just sheer finances, that all of a sudden this isn't working out anymore because the economy's changed, right? Some of the reasons are, I find myself in this job and I just hate it. I didn't realize I hated it until now. But I really hate it. 
So I need to go do something else that I don't hate anymore. You know what I mean? And, and, and that stuff happens, and that's the whole thing about the whole thing about finding inspiration. All of a sudden you think, another inspirational story, real close to home. My mother-in-law, Diane, obviously has gone through some major upheaval in her life. I mean, uh, Bill passed away about eight months ago. Um, all kinds of things going on, but what does she do? She doesn't just sit on the couch and eat Miss Vicky's chips. She takes, she went out and she took uh, an ESL course. Um, she's thinking about uh, applying for some jobs. I mean, she's at the, she's at the stage, and, and it's not like that she's in a situation where she has to do this stuff, but she wants to, she wants to be doing something. She wants to be, she wants, something has inspired her to move. Something's motivated her to, to move on. And that motivates me. That inspires me. Uh, another inspirational story. There's lots of them. These are all fr from around me. There's a fellow at work. His name's Franz Vandenherk. He works for me. And Franz, I, I get to know all the guys pretty well that actually work around me and for me. I have c conversations with them, figure out where they're at in their life. And, and Franz, I asked him what he's planning to do once, you know, and he says, well, I think I'm going to see this project to the end, which is a, probably a couple more years. And uh, then after that, I'm going to go, I'm planning to go to the University of Toronto and study physics. I said, oh, that's awesome, Franz. And, you know, why do you want to do that? He said, well, I started it, you know, years ago and never completed it. And I just want to go back and finish my degree. Franz is 70 years old. He's 70. And he's working on an industrial construction site. And when I found out he's 70, he almost fell over. And he doesn't need to be there. Franz financially does not need to be there, but he loves it. He, he loves that type of work. He loves the, the, uh, the younger guys that he's working with. He loves the dynamic of it all. But when he's done, when he figures that he's done, he figures this might be his last project of that, that nature, he's going to go to the University of Toronto and study physics. And one of the main reasons why he wants to go to the University of Toronto and study physics, besides what I just said, is that he loves to argue. He said, I can't wait to argue with professors. Because they all think they're so smart, he said. They all think they're so smart. Yeah. And actually, it's a lot of fun watching Franz argue with the engineers, too, on site. And most time, Franz is right. And that, that's a cool thing. Anyway, so there's all kinds of places to find inspiration. Let's turn to... Uh, let's turn to Isaiah, chapter 40. I've got to find it. In my little book here. Because again, I like it. I like it uh, in the message version. And I can't find my message Bible. Verse I'm going to go to. I'll start in verse 12, I think. I can find it. There it is. You know what? I think I'll go way back to verse 1 first. Just, I won't read, I won't read the whole chapter, but God's word just have, has a way of saying what it wants to say compared to me. In verse, 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 verse 1 and 2, and this is this is a message to all of us, actually, this verse 1 and 2 of Isaiah, and, and, and how we deal with anybody, and how we deal with uh, our, our co-workers, how we deal with the people that work for us, the people that we work for, how we deal with our families. And there's just, a, there's just such a, uh, you just feel God's heart in this first, this first couple of verses. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak softly and tenderly to Jerusalem. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak softly and tenderly to Jerusalem. There's something about this softness and this tenderness. Not, not that, like you might find yourself in a situation where correction is needed. You might find yourself in a situation where you need to be corrected. You might find yourself where, where there's, it's not all just peace and love and flowers and all that kind of stuff because you're dealing with situations. But at the end of the, at the, end of the day, you just feel God's heart in that. Right? Speak softly and tenderly. And this whole thing about finding inspiration and then all of a sudden transforming and being the inspiration. And we let God's heart motivate us. And even, even if you're dealing with a crew of construction workers, right? You can speak tenderly to them. And believe it or not, they respond. They love it. Because, because they're not being sworn at. You know what I mean? They're not being you know, kicked in the... You know, they're, they're being treated well and respected. And... and it's the whole thing about moving from finding inspiration to being inspiration. 
speak softly and tenderly to Jerusalem, but also make it very clear that she has served her sentence. I love that. And that's, that's the whole thing, uh, you know, that's the whole John 3.16 message. Make it very clear that she has served her sentence, for God so loved the world. Right? Make it very clear that she has served her sentence, that her sin is taken care of, forgiven. She's been punished enough. And the, this, this whole thing about inspiration again now, the people that are around you every day, they've been punished enough, they've suffered enough. They don't need you to judge them and cause them to suffer any more than they already have. Because of, maybe it's because of choices that they made. Maybe it's because of circumstances beyond their control. But they've suffered enough. And they don't need us to judge them because of the, the suffering state that we see them in. They need us to comfort them. And tell them they've suffered enough. And point the way to Jesus. And give them hope. And inspire them to... Because to, what happens is when you live long enough in front of people, they, they tend to say, hey, what's, what's going on with you? I had a guy at work ask me, say, why don't you swear? And I said, I don't even know. I said, I don't, I don't try not to swear. You know, but he said, there's something different. He says, you don't swear. Anybody else I've ever worked for in a construction site swears. I said, well... I guess, you know, and then I start telling the story, right? I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for a long time, and stuff like that's slowly been weeded out of my life. And I don't swear as much as I used to, that's for sure. I'm sure God's word slips out from time to time when I get really angry. But there's something that's happened. There's a transformation. The whole, the whole speaking tenderly. Make her clear that she has served her sentence, that her sin is taken care of, forgiven. She's been punished enough and more than enough. And the last part of that verse says, and now it's over and done with. That's nice, isn't it? It's over and done with. And that's all, obviously, that was a prophetic message to Jerusalem during the Old Testament time. But I, I take that this morning, I take it as I read that even before this morning, I take that as a message to me. That when I'm dealing with, with mankind, you know, I'm dealing with the folks, I'm dealing with my family, is basically, it's time to be tender in Jesus' name. It's time to comfort in Jesus' name. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's time to be an inspiration. And you don't even have to try to be an inspiration. Live, live by these things and you'll inspire. Let's turn to... Uh, oh, you know what? I'm gonna, I got another inspirational story. Just thought of it. A uh, fellow by the name of Derek Redman. Anybody remember that name? He was a 400-meter guy. Uh, way back, 1992 Barcelona Olympic Games. Remember that story? Anyway, some of you remember. It was kind of, for a while, there was kind of a famous story. He, this fellow, he, he, was, he was training for the 1988 Olympics in Seoul, and he tore his Achilles tendon. And he had, uh, so that obviously screwed him up. He didn't go to the, the Seoul Olympics. Um, he had multiple surgeries after that to get himself ready, but he, he, was, he was more than ready for uh, the 92 Olympics in Barcelona. And he'd been training hard, and... Uh, this is kind of his, obviously, his life's ambition. And he was one of the medal favorites going in. And um, what he did, he, he won his heat. And then they had, uh, I don't know if it was another heat or a semifinal or something, but he won that too. So he's in the final now. He's in the Olympic Games. He's, he's a favorite to medal. You know, not necessarily a gold medal, but definitely, definitely you know, he's, he's going to be on the podium as, ever, as long as everything goes well. Anyway, so he's, 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 he's the, the race starts. He goes hard. You can watch it's on. You can watch it on YouTube. It's kind of. I mean, it's, it's devastating, but it's cool. 150 meters in, he's he's basically you know second or third and right close to the leader, or kind of right where he planned to be at that point. And all of a sudden, he, he tears his hamstring, like didn't, and and he just goes into a heap on the track. And this is you got to think about this. Like these athletes, this is what they've lived, ate, and bred. This is this is this is this is everything for them at this point. And then, so he gets up, and he's, he's kind of trying to hobble, but he goes down again. And all of a sudden, this, this man goes running out of the crowd, and there was like 65,000 people in the stadium in Barcelona at the time. He goes running out of the crowd, pushes his way through security, and goes and, and, and grabs him. And, and says to him, hey, you don't have to do this. And, the, and then Derek says to him, the guy, the, the guy that did it was actually his dad. His name was Jim Redmond. Says to, to him, yes, I do. He says, well, if you do it, I'm gonna, he said, I'll help you. So anyway, so he basically, he couldn't put any, any weight on the one leg, and he kind of hobbled his way around the track to the finish line, and his dad just kind of left him for the last, you know, four or five meters to finish it all by himself. The whole place erupted into a standing ovation, 
65,000 people. Applause, like there, 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 there's applause there, like for, like they, at, the, at the time, that was the biggest applause of the 1992 Barcelona Olympics. The whole place just erupted into applause. And what they found, they found inspiration in what, number one is the, the, the thing about the human perseverance of, of Derek, but then the, then the love of his father just breaking onto the track and, and had to fight his way through security, and that's on the camera too, fight his way through security to get to his son, to help him finish the race. And you know, in, 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 in some of my previous chats, I've talked about races and all this kind of stuff, but the fact of the matter is, is that that's such a picture of God and us. Sometimes we find ourselves hamstrung, so to speak, where we can barely walk. I'm on the couch eating my Miss Vicky chips, and out, out of nowhere comes God, right? Dragging me toward the finish line. You know, dragging me toward the finish line. And, and, and no matter where you find yourself today, you know, if you're, if you're spiritually on the couch eating Miss Vicky chips, salt and vinegar chips, God's going to break through the security. God's going to break through the, 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 the enemy line, so to speak. God's going to break through, and he, he's going to carry you to the finish line. And at the end, he'll, he'll know when it's time to cut you loose. He'll know when it's time to turn you loose. He'll know when, when, when there's, uh, there's enough time that you can actually finish this race on your own. And he'll turn you loose. He'll say, there you go. You've got to finish, but you, you've got to do it on your own at the end. You've got to cross that line. But I'm going to get you right to the point where now, now you're good. Now you're good. Because you have to do this. Thing. Much like Derek, the sprinter, had to do that, had to finish. Right. You have to do this thing. You know, no matter what's going on in your life, we have to do this thing. Let's go to uh, one last, one last verse. Uh, we'll go to Romans chapter 8. So far my technology hasn't failed me. See what verse I was thinking of there. I don't. Aha, uh aha. -huh. Uh -huh. Let me go to verse. I think I'll try, try verse 18 and see how it works out. Oh yeah, I'm gonna go down a bit. I think I'll start in uh, verse 22. This is all about becoming that inspiration, right? I mean. In verse 22 of Romans 8, it says, All around us we observe a pregnant creation. I love the message. A pregnant creation. They want to get, it wants to give birth to something, right? It wants, to, it wants to have something burst forth, some life come out of it. It's, all, it's, it's like we're walking around the maternity ward, and there's all these women that are about ready to give birth. You know, there, there's, there's, there's a bunch of suffering going on, right? In those, in, in, if you're... I've been to the maternity ward four times. And, and there's a bunch of suffering going on, and there's a bunch of sweating going on, and there's a bunch of encouraging going on, and a bunch of breathing going on. <laughs> a bunch of hand-holding and squeezing, all that kind of stuff going on. But the fact of the matter is there's an excitement, there's anticipation, there's a new life that's about to be born. You know, for me, first it was Alicia, right? Then it was Brianna. Then it was Christopher and Daniel are out there in the crowd. You know, there's excitement about this, these new life coming forth. Spiritually speaking, according to the book of Romans, and we can, I'm not going to read the whole thing, the book of Romans, it's the same thing now with creation. It's that same kind of anticipation, that same kind of excitement, because there's a whole bunch of, whole bunch of small s sons of God that are being born into this world call, and, and called to be an inspiration to the world, called to be, you know, whether it's social justice, whether it's, you know, just being an evangelist, when I say just, and obviously very important, whether, whether it's going over to Africa and doing the things, whether it's in the streets of Penticton, whether it's working for the youth in this city, you know, whether it's playing road hockey on August 17th, you know, it's in the Bolton, by the way. Um, there's, there's this whole thing about this creation that's just eager to be inspired by sons and daughters of God. And that's us. It's not a hard thing. It's a, it's, and, and the thing is, we don't have to be something we're not. We don't have to be soldiers when we're shepherds. You know what I mean, we don't have to try to put on this armor that doesn't fit. 
You know what I mean? I, I don't have to, I don't, I don't have to be a, a plumber when I'm called to be an accountant. Or I don't have to be an accountant when I'm called to be a plumber. You know what I mean? Let's, let, we, we just gotta, we, we just gotta find our fit, and most of us have found it, praise God. We need to find our fit and just let life happen. And be a blessing. And, and, and speak that, that, that calming voice to creation. And, and call this whole thing forth. The difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pains. But it's not only around us, it's within us. The Spirit of God is arousing us within. We're also feeling the birth pains. These sterile and barren bodies of ours are yearning for full deliverance. You know, we find ourselves, again, spiritually on the couch eating those salt and vinegar chips, and we're just yearning for deliverance. We're yearning, even though we don't want to do anything at that point in time. We just want to stay there. You know, maybe we're watching uh, Oprah or whatever it is that you watch, but we don't want to move, right? We just want to stay there. But there's something inside you that knows there's, there's a calling for something more. Yearning for deliverance. That is why waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes the pregnant mother. That's why waiting for this, this, this God life to come forth. When I was there for my kids' birth, there was lots of waiting and lots of survey, all that kind of stuff going on. But then all of a sudden there's the birth. And all that other stuff is forgotten. Immediately. It's crazy. It's just forgotten. There's no, and now it's just joy. And that's spiritually, spiritually that's what we're called to. Yearning for full de 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 deliverance. We are enlarged in the waiting. Ever seen, uh, of course you have, a pregnant lady that's just about ready to give birth? Rather enlarged. Enlarged in the waiting. We, of course, don't see what is enlarging us. We don't see what's... We, it's just like, you know, the, well, now with modern technology, of course you can see what's enlarging you. But with, uh, especially at the time, this is where we didn't see what was enlarging us. But the longer we wait, the larger we, be, we become. And the more joyful our expectancy. So be the calming voice to this world. Right? Find some inspiration. And then, and then and let God's Spirit work with you, no matter where you're at, to become that inspiration. And for most of us, we spend way more time at work, waking hours, than we do doing anything else. That's what we do. And that can be a blessing. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's a good thing. We're called to work. But we work. We spend way more of our waking hours working. So let's, let's, let's be the inspiration. Whether, and for kids, you spend more waking hours at school or college or wherever you are than, than you do doing anything else. So be the inspiration. Be the, be the hope. Be that, that son or daughter of God. But don't try to be anything you're not. If you're a shepherd, be a shepherd. Don't be a soldier. If you're a soldier, be a soldier. Don't be a shepherd. Amen. I think I'll... You want to wrap it up? I'll deviate from the plan. Thank you very much, Brian. All right. Well...